all right, all right, all right. It is a great day in South Florida. Welcome to Living in South Florida. My name is Chris Igo, and today we are touring through downtown West Palm Beach. We are going to trend into Worth Avenue and into Palm Beach Island. We are going to tour some incredibly affluent areas. But more importantly than that, we're gonna talk about the main topic that everybody right now is thinking about, which is, is the housing bubble about to burst? That's the question everybody wants to know about. Everybody's talking about the economic conditions that exist right now, um, the stock market correction that we've been experiencing, the intermarket um, dynamics that exist, you know, across the board, across every spectrum, across every asset class. Um, oops, and now I am stuck behind a truck that appears to be loading. Um, but nonetheless, there's a lot of fear, there's a lot of uncertainty, there's a lot of noise that's out there. And if there's one thing that the market absolutely loathes, and when I say market, I'm talking about any market, is fear and uncertainty. Those are the two conditions that um, that will disable anyone from making the proper decision um, in order to uh, you know make the best decision for themselves, for their family, and for their financial bottom line. And I hope that made sense and I said it the right way. So, okay, let's talk about some of the things that are happening right now that relate to um, really everything, okay? And I'm gonna go back, give a little bit of historical context of my own experience. I'm gonna take off my realtor hat for a second. I do have some experience um, in different markets. So back in 1997, I became a uh, Series 7 licensed um, stockbroker. And um, I went out there and I experienced every single thing that happened in the equities markets from 1997 until I got out of that business, which let's call it, let's just round up to 2010, okay? So that's a long period of time. And the first thing that I remember from getting my license in 1997, almost instantly, the first thing that I was confronted with, my first challenge was the Asian crisis that was happening right then and there. It was, um, I don't even remember the dynamics that, that existed. I was so fresh and so new. I had to govern myself with up till that point was uh, what my experience had been. And I had not been exposed to uh, market conditions like that. And so here I am as a young guy uh, managing um, high net worth individuals. So always working with accredited investors, always doing the right thing and making sure that I'm working with the right clients um, to be able to uh, uh, hold on, make sure I'm not getting into a car accident here. But it was always very important in any business to know your customer, to understand their what their objectives are, to understand um, what their goals are, what their uh, what they want, uh, what their financial uh, risk tolerance are, uh, or tolerance is. Um, across the board, you know, uh, getting to know your customer is your most important job description, uh, in my opinion. And so I only say that to provide a little bit of context in that, like I was in a new air, I was in a completely different world. So I get licensed, I've got clients, I'm handling money, I'm trading stock positions. And then all of a sudden it's the Asian crisis. I've never experienced a crisis before. I have no concept of what that actually means or what the real world application for that is. I just know that CNBC is is going bananas about this Asian crisis and the stocks are selling off and the and it went there was a lot of fear there was a lot of uncertainty and I was inexperienced in that spot okay well from there what happened lots of things the entire all right we are crossing over um, into Palm Beach Island right now and look at those yachts across the uh, across the um, intercoastal. We are going over the bridge. We are going to make our way downtown into, well, we just went through downtown, but over to the, uh, to Worth Avenue. And we're just going to uh, work our way up and down the coast, but look at some of these incredible yachts. 
I mean, it doesn't get much better than this. And the real estate on Palm Beach Island is going to be super affluent, super luxurious, super pricey, and everything around there is going, or around this area is going to cater to that lifestyle. All right, so lots of high-end everything, lots of uh, exclusive uh, shopping, retail, restaurants, anything that you could ever want. This is um, this is old money. This is Palm Beach at its finest and most affluent. Um, okay, so we are going to continue talking about what's going on in the market right now. You've got the Flagler Museum to our left, and a lot of these. Um, I mean, there's <laughs> there are so many nice things here that I don't even know where to start. All kinds of incredible hotels, all types of uh, incredible experiences that you can have. But where we're going in particular is a landmark destination. It is a little bit of a, uh, I don't want to call it a tourist trap, but, um, but it is a super nice street. I mean, this is the equivalent of uh, Rodeo Drive out there in uh, California, right? So we're going to keep on trucking and I'm going to make a right, which will take us to Worth Avenue. But back to the market dynamics that exist and the fear and uncertainty that exists in the market and how you can best govern yourself given these um, economic unknowns, right? So the fear and uncertainty. Well, if you're out there right now and you're looking to buy a property, is right now the best time for you to buy a property uh, in Florida? And the answer to that question is, I don't know. Only you know that. So the first step in that um, analysis that I would have is making sure that you understand your financial picture. I would have a conversation with your financial advisor. I would get very granular as to what you can afford and why you're doing what you're doing so that you can make the best decision for yourself and for your family and for your financial bottom line. So what does that really mean? Well, if you need to move to Florida and you've made a decision that that's what you want to do and whether you're moving up or down within the state is um, somewhat irrelevant because the same analysis applies. Um, but I'll get into that in a, in a section in, in a moment here. Um, but why are you doing what you're doing? Can you afford to do what you're doing? Does this change your, um, does this have an impact on your uh, lifestyle right now? Is this the best move for you? I don't know. Only you're going to know the answer to that, right? And so let's keep on trucking. left here and uh, it's giving me a detour I don't want to take that detour all right and we are going to take this to the beach and we're going to check out all of this ultra exclusive uh, coastal lifestyle out here in Palm Beach. But getting back to what my point was, the fear, the uncertainty, the is the housing bubble about to burst? Uh, is the housing market bubble about to burst? Um, as we come up on this incredible ocean view and beach and the very historic um, clock tower that exists right here that Palm Beach is famous for. Okay, well, we'll check that out here momentarily. But let's go down Worth Avenue and check out some of the most exclusive affluent shopping that exists on planet Earth, short of maybe a few places. Um, for example, uh, Rodeo Drive. All right. But here we go. You've got all kinds of different. You've got Gucci. You've got, uh, now as you can see, parking is not exactly easy <laughs> to get on the street. But all kinds of high-end different things. Some incredible alfresco dining that exists. You've got some parking, Louis Vuitton. Uh, you've got Saks Fifth Avenue right here. And some of the most affluent shopping and um opportunities that you can find out here right on Worth Avenue. All right. 
But as we're, let's contrast this. This is the best of the best and the most affluent and nobody here seems to be concerned about any particular market dynamics that may exist because they're going out there and spending whatever they want to spend on whatever they want to buy. And there's a lot of that. That is a perfect uh, analogy to what goes on out here as it relates to South Florida real estate. Most of the buyers who are coming to this area, not everybody, and I'm painting this with a, uh, with a broad brush, but most of the people who want to be in Palm Beach County are affluent, they have money, they want what they want when they want it, and they are prepared to spend whatever it takes for them to get exactly what they want. And so that is a unique scenario that does not apply everywhere, right? In Palm Beach County, there is no more real estate to develop. There, when I say real estate, there's no more land to develop. So there is a scarcity of land that exists in South Florida, period. And because of that, I make the argument that we are more insulated than other places to market risks that are going to present themselves in those other areas. So if you look at um, other places in the country, other markets that exist in the country where there's a lot more land for them to develop and the supply and demand issues that exist now are, <coughs> are skewed because of the, because of a lot of different reasons. I would say those markets are more inherent and more subject to um, a correction and a crash than you're gonna find here. In, uh, in, in South Florida, right? So all that being said, let's talk about what's happened in the market today and, um, and address the elephants that exist within the room. Okay, so, and I started talking about my, my past experience as a stockbroker, and I don't think I finished articulating my, my point, which is right out the gate, 1997, it was the Asian crisis. And then after that, it was the tech bubble and the dot-com bubble and the every other bubble that exists. In 2005, 2006, 2007, it was the real estate market, which the subprime loans and the credit default swaps and the too big to fail and the financial institutions failing and the government coming in and saving the day and not allowing the free market to do what it's supposed to do. Too big to fail is a recipe for disaster. And I said that from day one instantaneously right out the gate. You cannot go out there and insulate the insulate the market from or the economy or the country from feeling the pain of propping up anything that um, should not be propped up. Because what eventually happens if you do that is what we're about to experience as we move forward into this new normal. So everyone is out there predicting that we're going to see a recession, which I've been talking about for a while, and that we're going to see an economic meltdown of epic proportions that we've never experienced before. And I agree with that. I mean, that's a fact. I do agree with that. I think we started to see what that could look like um, back in the financial crisis, prior to the government stepping in and intervening and um, providing TARP and providing whatever else they provided. And I'm not gonna go into great detail as to what that is. You can go back and Google and look up what it was, um, but it's very well defined. They came in, they did extraordinary things uh, to go out there, prop up the economy, prop up the country, prop up the markets, and they haven't stopped doing that since, period. So the first shock to the system goes back to September 11th. And then right after that, there were a series of, of interventions that happened from a uh, government perspective that have never happened in the history of the world. And, and that is all part of what we're going to be experiencing as we move forward. So hopefully that makes sense. And if it didn't, then please leave a question down below. All right, a little bit of technical difficulty there, but I hope that made sense. And uh, if you've got any questions or, um, or comments, then please leave them down below and I'll be happy to answer them as soon as I possibly can. Hopefully we're getting a better uh, read here on the video because this is gorgeous. Look how pretty this is. Um, this is an incredibly affluent 
place to live where you can live the coastal lifestyle in the most luxurious setting that exists on planet Earth. And this is where the players play. This is the most um, scarce land that exists, period, end of story. But now let's get back to um, where I was going with uh, kicking the can down the road. Right, so the government's done all kinds of different things to go out there and um, insulate the market from the market dynamics that should have gone, gone into effect. So I remember back when the uh, market was in free fall, right? And I've experienced lots of this. Um, and so have many other people. So it's not like my experience is unique. Uh, if you're old enough, you'll go through many of these. Um, you'll suffer through many of these cycles that exist. But I think the one that we're about to go to is a new cycle that we've never experienced before, which does not mean to say that you shouldn't buy or sell real estate. It just means to say that you should be aware of what's going on and govern yourself accordingly. So if you must and want to buy right now, then you should assuming you can afford what that means to you and what those obligations are and what it you must have granularity on why you're doing what you're doing and whether you can afford what you're doing in the event the market was to go to zero tomorrow now the market's not going to zero tomorrow it's impossible for a market to go to zero so the stock market is not going to zero your real estate uh, investment is not going to zero the home that you bought yesterday is not going to zero uh, period none of those things are gonna happen but if they did take a massive hit and they were to go down 50% tomorrow um, whoop do freaking do because you weren't planning on selling tomorrow anyway right period and so part of that conversation needs to be, uh, or part of the analysis as to why you're doing what you're doing needs to be <laughs> exactly that. Why are you doing this right now? And if you check all the boxes and they all make sense to you, then it's a good decision. And so, <clears throat> and the reason for that is over time, you're going to be just fine. And I'll give an example of that. So in my experience, back when the stock market, we were in free fall and there was blood in the streets. And there was, when I say blood in the streets, that's an example, I don't really mean there was blood in the streets. Um, but it's uh, when there, be greedy when others are fearful and fearful when others are greedy. That's what Warren Buffett said. But I, I use that to illustrate the point. When Bank of America was at $2, when Ford was at a dollar, when some of the best companies that existed in the United States were on fire sale, I had the presence of mind and the powder dry to be able to go out there and purchase lots of those equities. There we go. We're rolling up on Mar-a-Lago, as you can tell by the police presence. Um, somebody if they got pulled over. I wasn't paying much attention. I was on a roll. But uh, there's Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago. And this is, I mean, look, this is Palm Beach at its finest. This is the ultimate of the, of the ultimate. This is an incredible place to live. And this is where the players play. So I am going to continue to go down the coast and not go back into downtown Palm Beach so I can showcase more of how sweet this area is, but also finish my point. So is the housing market bubble about to burst? And my answer to that is it depends on where you're at. So let's get back to the, um, the stock analysis that I was, I was talking about before. So right now, if you look at some of the, and I'm looking for leading indicators, right? I'm looking for leading indicators and I'm mindful not to get caught in the trap of looking at lagging indicators. So most things in real estate tend to be lagging indicators. That's just the nature of the business. I can see what happened yesterday and a lot of the realtors that are out there in the space, including NAR, they're providing as good as of context as they can but what their analysis is looking at is all lead is all lagging indicators so me looking at what happened last month look at how incredible these homes are right so 
irrespective of where we are at in a market cycle, what I can tell you is, especially in the area that we're at right now, which is coastal Palm Beach, there are no homes. There's, I mean, there is such a, and by the way, these homes, these are not homes. These are mega mansions. These are oceanfront, ridiculous, uh, 50, $100 million, $100 million plus um, estates that exist right on the ocean. So this is the elite of the elite, and don't get it twisted. This is this is where uh, this is where true net worth, high level um, affluence exists, and anything that's on the uh, the coast right here is going to be um, ridiculously premium and super luxurious. <clears throat> All right, super private, super secure, and you're paying a. Um, a very healthy premium to uh, to live this lifestyle, but there is no other land that can be replicated to to enjoy this uh, this experience. So these types of homes are going to be insulated uh, relative to other places because there's no more coastal land. There is there's only one uh, Palm Beach Island, and there's only so much beach and uh, waterfront oceanfront homes that you can build. Period. So. That is a market within a market. All right, so now going back to where I was at, and I've kind of lost my train of thought here. Uh, where was I? Um, fear, uncertainty, oh, lagging indicators, right. So some of the best analysis that I'm getting from realtor organizations right now are telling me how history shows that within, um, it is, what was the latest thing I saw? I saw and I forget who put this out. It doesn't matter, it illustrates the point. But I saw a snapshot of time, which was then turned into an article, which showcased how the last six recessions did not um, necessarily prove, this last six recessions prove that um, a, a housing crash is not guaranteed. or something to that effect and I hope that made sense and I looked at this article and I said well this is utter nonsense um, yes it's true that that in the time snap in the short window of time that they're making this analysis and extrapolating their own uh, um, outcome uh, yeah what you're saying is true under that narrow window under that small microscope but if you extend that out a little bit like you must in order to actually make a statement like that it's easily refuted and so yeah it is true that if you look at between now and you know I think it was 1990 um, and you look backwards in time, can you make an argument that of the last six recessions that there have only been, there's only been a housing uh, correction in two of them? Yes, you can make that argument. Okay, great. Well, that doesn't mean anything. If you then take the other outside influences and occurrences that have happened and add them in too. Okay, like for example, the trillions of dollars that have been printed in, um, which has raised the um, the uh, amount of cash on hand in the uh, in the market. That's massive inflation. That's massive money printing. That's never happened in the history of the world. So to make the all right, another technical difficulty. Not exactly sure what happened or where I got. All right, all right, all right. Minor technical difficulty. I'm not exactly sure where I got cut off there. But um, hopefully I can connect the dots to what I was just talking about. But to look at the uh, to look at that small snapshot of time and then compare it to what's actually happening right now um, is just not responsible. And honestly, I think it's just stupid. Um, because the truth is, what we're looking at right now is unique. It's never happened before. And by never happened before. I don't mean me hitting the jogger that's in front of me. I mean, if we're looking at what's happening right now, you cannot look at lagging indicators um, and think that you're going to understand what's gonna happen moving forward, right? It would be irresponsible to do that. So when I look at certain things like, for example, I hear the president talking about, um, oh, look at the job, look, look at what we're doing in terms of job creation. That is a lagging indicator. It's also nonsense, because if you look at some of the 
leading indicators, you're going to see that there's obviously trouble brewing on the horizon. It is just irrefutable that that's true. You've got um, Amazon, you've got Walmart, you've got Target that are out there with an oversupply that just today, I think it was Target came in talking about their um, aggressive moves they're making in order to uh, get rid of their oversupply of inventory. Okay, well, if the largest retail, we're in a consumer-based economy, right? So if the biggest suppliers of um, of goods and services, or of products out there right now is telling you there's a massive oversupply because people aren't buying them. That's a leading indicator that people aren't buying like they used to. Well, no kidding. Gas prices have increased radically. Um, incomes have not appreciated radically. Uh, the cost of inflation has increased radically. So the cost of goods and services, which is inflation, has gone up radically. Okay, well, where are people feeling that the most? They're feeling it the most right now in their budget. In their, They're making day-to-day -day decisions on how to live their best life now. And the truth is, we're gonna have a lot of people that are gonna have to make some hard choices right now, and they also have lots of equity in their homes. So it's likely that what we're going to see as a solution to their problem is going to be more listings that hit the market. Now, depending on where you're at in the country and what market that you're in, we're going back over the uh, bridge, over the intercoastal, and we're gonna check out a little bit of downtown Lake Worth. Um, and then I'm going to uh, continue talking because I'm hoping all this makes sense and ties together because my technology keeps uh, getting interrupted and I, <laughs> and, I, and I don't know that it all makes sense, but I hope it does. Um, okay, so uh, where was I at? Um, okay, so what is the solution to the to this financial crisis that has to happen? It just has to happen. Why? Because inflation has gone through the roof. Wages have not increased um, uh, in an equivalent fashion. And although the in real estate is a good hedge against inflation, no doubt, if everything else has gone up 10x, and yes, you're locked into your um, your mortgage payment at a very optimal um, um, fixed price. Well, that's great. However, if you've got to make a decision as to whether you're going to feed your family or you're going to um, not feed your family, chances are you're going to feed your family. And how are you going to solve that problem? You're going to cash out of the equity position that you have in the home that you have. So it stands to reason there is going to be a lot more inventory that hits the market everywhere in uh, at some point in the near future. Now, I don't know when, and I don't know what that's gonna look like, and the absorption of that inventory is going to be different depending on where you're at. I believe that where I'm at in my hyper-local area, I think we are insulated because there's so much demand um, that exists from people around the country and around the world that want to be in Florida, and specifically South Florida, specifically South Palm Beach County or West Broward. There is such a demand for those types of places that it's going to be okay. It's going to return to what a normal balanced market looks like, which I've been talking about for a while as being the best case scenario. We want that to happen. I don't like having to represent buyers and going up against a hundred different other buyers who are all willing to do whatever it takes to buy the home. I don't think, um, you know, is, it, is that a good position to be in from a seller's persp perspective? Yeah, but we're starting to see the sellers um, get more reality based because they're going to need, especially as market conditions change, they're going to need to get cashed out. They're going to need to tap into their equity. They're going to need to sell. So what does that look like on either side of the fence? Well, from the seller side, it means 
you need to be smart. You, be, you need to be prudent. You need to price your home the right way to create a market within a market that gives you some leverage relative to the rest of the market. And there's a solution for that. On the buy side, it means congratulations. Hey, look, you're not gonna be going out against a hundred other buyers that are looking to get the same thing you are. You're probably gonna be looking at a market where there are far less qualified buyers and far more inventory for you to choose from. And that is the best scenario that you can be at right now. But now let's take a, so hopefully I answered that question, but let's remove that from our analysis right now and then talk about the rest of the market and what's likely to happen. Okay, let's do that. Well, we've been kicking the can down the road. Um, where am I going here? I am trying to get to the turnpike and I may or may not be going in the right direction. Uh, 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 um, these roundabouts are not my favorite. Um, okay, let's see. I, th <laughs> I think this is, this is where I want to be going. Um, as you can see behind me, that's the way to Lake Worth Beach. Yes, we know we were just there, but we are headed to the turnpike and headed out west. <laughs> And hopefully answering the question that everybody is interested in, which is, is the housing market about to, is the housing market bubble about to burst? And so that's where we're going with this. All right, if you're a buyer, you're in a much better position. There's gonna be far less competition. However, depending on what your finances are, depending on where you're at financially, you might be in a much worse position and have less options as it relates to affordability. I don't know. That's why it's important to have those conversations up front with your financial advisor, with me, with a lender, so we can have crystal clarity as to what needs to be done in order to get you a competitive advantage given the market dynamics of whenever it is that we're having this conversation and you're ready to make a decision. I'm blowing through yellow lights. <laughs> um, all right. And on the seller side, well, what does that mean for you? It means, look, hey, listen, uh, make hay while the sun's shining. Yes, you have a home. Yes, you have equity. Yes, you can get what you want. But yes, you gotta price it the right way and do all the things that are necessary to give you a competitive advantage in the market that we're in right now. And today's market is not yesterday's market, is not last month's market, is not six months ago's market, is certainly not last year's market. We are in new territory, but okay, fine. I said all that going into the bigger macro picture what does that look like? Okay, well, let's see. It's scary, and there's no two ways about that, right? So we've got Walmart out there, we've got Amazon, we've got Target, they're talking about oversupply, they're talking about um, layoffs likely to come in the future, and that's just three of the biggest. You can extend that outward uh, as much as you want. If you pay attention to what's happening in terms of anticipatory vehicles that help us predict what's going to happen in the future, meaning leading uh, market indicators, and look at some of the corporate governance that exists in terms of earnings forecasts and all of those, th all of the transparency that exists. And what you find is some of the smartest people on the planet, like Elon Musk, like Michael Burry, the, the uh, analyst who went out there and called the, um, the financial crisis uh, back in 2008, they're all saying, uh-oh, the unintended consequence of those things that happened way back in the day, and again, way back in the day being 15, 20 years ago, well, they are here to be addressed today. And we're going to feel the pain of what was happened, of what happened back then right now. So we are going to experience, exper experience, experience short-term pain. And it may be long-term pain. If you look at what happened in Japan, um, when they had their Great Recession, they went through a period of 10 years where basically their economy was uh, stuck. And we're likely to feel something similar to that too, period. Um, I hope that doesn't happen, but you better be prepared for the short-term pain um, and govern yourself accordingly. Well, does that short term of pain that exists economically, which could look like mass layoffs, it could look like mass inflation, it could look like um, uh, 
all kinds of different things that <laughs> none of which are good, but it looks like, um, where was I going with this? What the future could look like is hyperinflation, a devaluation of currency, um, you know, in, in certain countries where we've had, where not we've had, but where there's been hyperinflation, you also have, for lack of a better term, civil war. You have all kinds of different things that we have never experienced in our life that are possible outcomes in the future. And when I hear somebody like Charlie Munger of uh, Berkshire Hath Hathaway talk about some of those dynamics that could happen. You mentioned we're in a big bubble. Can you elaborate on that? And how is this likely to play out? When you print money on the scale that modern nations are printing it, Japan, the United States, Europe, et cetera, we're getting into new territory in terms of size. There's never been anything quite like what we're doing now. And we do know from what's happened in other nations, if you try and print too much money, it eventually causes terrible trouble. And we are closer to terrible trouble than we've been in the past, but it may still be a long way off. I certainly hope so. When Volcker, after the 70s, took the prime rate to 20% and the government was paying 15% on its government bonds, that was a horrible recession. It lasted a long time, caused a lot of agony. And I certainly hope we're not going there again. I think the conditions that allowed Volcker to do that without an interference from the politicians were very unusual. And I think in 2020 hindsight, it was a good thing that he did it. I would not predict that our modern politicians will be as willing to permit a new Volcker to get that tough with the economy and bring on that kind of a recession. So I think the new troubles are likely to be different from the old troubles. You may wish you had a Volcker style recession instead of what you're gonna get. The troubles that come to us could be worse than what Volcker was dealing with and harder like to fix. Think of all the Latin American countries that print too much money. They get strong men and so forth. That's what Plato said happened in the early Greek city-state democracies. One person, one vote, a lot of egality, and you get demagogues and the demagogues lather up the population and pretty soon you don't have your democracy anymore. It's scary, but okay, yeah, it's scary. Well, that doesn't mean that we hide under under our bed and suck our thumb. It means we make prudent decisions to help um, insulate ourselves and our family to live our best life now. And if buying a home is part of your best life now analysis, then do it. If you've outgrown your home and you want a, so there's all kinds of reasons as to why you might want to buy or sell a home right now. All this other stuff is me just giving you some context as to what I expect to happen everywhere else, right? So back in the 70s when we had this um, massive inflation and we had gas lines and we had all kinds of different shortages and uh, we had real recession, what happened? Well, Volcker came in and he increased uh, interest rates to 20%. Do you think there's any possibility that the government would allow someone to go out there and increase interest rates to 20%? I hope that happens because that would be the right thing to do if it's necessary. I don't think we're in an environment where that will be allowed to happen because none of that is an electable um, uh, move, right? And because of the, because of all the other dynamics that exist out there, that doesn't help us get to where we need to be. It hurts us. But I don't think anybody has the uh, internal fortitude, unfortunately, or enough of a uh, quorum to be able to make that happen. So I don't think we're going to see that type of intervention happen. What, in spite of the fact that we're posturing for that, to for it to look like that, I don't think that's actually going to happen. What I expect that we're going to see is none of that happen. I hope it does, but I don't think it will. And what does that look like? The answer is, I don't know, and neither does anybody else. But I do know that when the market feels pain, when the consumer feels pain, when there's real fear 
um, like there was for a short period of time in the financial crisis, and I'll give you context on this, when the, um, when the Fed funds rate, or excuse me, when the money market broke a buck, meaning the money market funds broke a buck, that was a historic thing that never happened before. That's not supposed to be able to happen, but the net asset value of the money market funds went from a dollar to I think 0.97. And that had never happened before. There were so many different factors. I mean, Greece went insolvent. There was a real fear that the financial system was going to fail and there would be a run on banks. All of those things are possible uh, things that could happen in the future. And what, do you, what will happen to the psychology of the market when those things are real issues that must be um, dealt with? I don't know, but I do know this, the biggest um, a Bitcoin, uh, what is it, market hedge, or I, I forgot the guy's name. Um, but when Bitcoin investors face a margin call, which will eliminate their position, that are which will wipe out billionaires, um, what does the market look like when that happens? Doesn't look good. Okay, separate to that. When the stock market gets cut in half, as it can easily happen, especially in an intraday trade or in a short-term play, what happened? So when there's margin calls that exist uh, because the market gets cut in half, and when I say market, I mean stock market, and the overly levered have to pay that bill, which then of course means more selling in the market. Uh, but what happens? Well, the market gets flushed out and then there's even more fear and more uncertainty and more turmoil that exists because the affluent are taking it right on the chin and the institutions are taking it right on the chin and the billionaires are taking it right on the chin. Okay, well, when all those things are happening, what impact does that have on you? Well, I don't know. I don't know, but I do know if you are able to live your best life in a home in, that provides you the best opportunity and lifestyle to live your best life, well then, that's the one controllable that you can control and you can control it right now. So, you know, this conversation is going to be geared differently depending on what your, um, on what your needs are. A conversation with an investor is very different than a conversation that I have with the family who is looking to move to South Florida and max out South Florida living to the fullest, period. It's gonna be a different conversation depending on which market you are looking to shop in and what your objective for that home is, period. On a That's on a one-on-one -on -one basis. But the rest of this is just to provide context because the truth is nobody has a freaking clue what the future holds. All I know is there are lots of unknown variables that exist out there today that cannot be um, taken lightly and also can't be put into and packaged into a short clip like what I just received from a uh, realtor organization stating that the last six, uh, the last six recessions or history proves, excuse me, history proves that a recession doesn't equal a market crash. Uh, maybe depends on how big that timeline is and it depends on a lot of other things which I don't believe are factored into that snapshot in the article that was sent to me. So be prudent, be responsible, live your best life now and if there's ever anything I can do to help serve or support you then please reach out, call, text, email, DM, send a carrier pigeon, a smoke signal by any means necessary because we've got your back when it comes to moving to or living in South Florida. And until next time, Peace.